Hi everyone, and welcome to part 4 of the DMC2 training series. In the last video, we looked at cutting tools and speeds and feeds, and now we're ready to apply those to a real toolpath. So after you have all of your CNC software set up, you're ready to begin the CAM process to generate the G-code files necessary for the machine to run. Most of you might be using Fusion 360 for CAM, which I also recommend since it's a very powerful CAD and CAM package, but other softwares are available and will work just as well. The DMC2 comes with two controller options out of the box. You can either use Mach 3 to interface with your CNC, which is recommended, or use Gerbil, which is an open source but less feature rich option. So you need the CAM software and a control software, and the CAM software generates the G code and outputs the G code file, and the control software takes in the G code file and manages sending the real time control signals to the CNC motors to execute motor movement. I highly recommend you do not use the same computer for both of these jobs. Your CAM computer should have better hardware to give you a smooth experience and fast generation times, and be in a comfortable, clean work environment. And your CNC controller computer can be a dirt cheap, old 64-bit Windows PC or a laptop. It will be subject to abuse, chips, dirty coolant hands touching it, and more importantly, you don't want other programs running on it while it's controlling the CNC, as any hiccup or slowdowns while running other programs can cause delayed CNC signals that ruin or affect your part finish. I will be using the Fusion 360 and Mach 3 combination for this video, but anything else you use will follow generally the same workflow. So let's start. You have a part in Fusion 360 you want to make. The first thing to do when you're ready to generate CAM files is to click on the drop down on the top left and go into manufacture mode. In manufacture mode, you now have a different toolbar up top with different machining operations and a setup folder on the left side tree. Basically the top is where you select an operation you want to do and the left is where each selected operation is stored in order. When you first go into manufacture mode, the very first thing to do is click on setup and make a setup for the part you want to cut. The setup is how you tell the machine what orientation the material is sitting inside your machine, and if you ever take the part out and move it around at all, you need a new setup for that new position. So on a CNC, the X, Y, and Z axis are always in the same directions, and you need to memorize that or draw it down somewhere. The X positive points to the right, the Y positive points towards the back, and the Z positive points up. So if you want your part to sit in the CNC like this, you need to orient it that way in the cam setup, and then make the X point right, the Y point back, and the Z point up. You can do this by clicking model orientation, and then selecting a method that works with your part. If I select the Z axis edge and the X axis edge here, that works, but the X is the wrong way. I can click the arrow tip to flip that. Now that that's correct, I need to know where I'm going to probe my part off of. Each surface that the probe touches needs to match the plane that the origin in CAM is located on. The origin is the white point in the middle of the coordinate system we just oriented. So for example, if I wanted to probe the front, left, and top surface of my part, I need my work coordinate system to be on the left, front, top corner of the part, so that it intersects each of those planes. So I click origin, and then click that point, which you can see has the option to snap to. Now, there's a few options here. I can use the selected point, which lets me select a feature on the model. I can use a model box point, which lets me select a point around the smallest possible rectangular box that fits around my part. Or I could click stock box point, which lets me pick a point around an imaginary stock piece of material around the entire part. You need to be careful and select the correct option based off whether you're going to machine your part out of an exact size and height piece of material, or if you're starting from something thicker and machining down from that oversized material. If you do this wrong, then you won't be probing off the right surfaces, and you'll end up overcutting or undercutting in the wrong areas, and potentially run into your vise or bed, and of course ruin the part. If you do select stock box point, you need to now click on the next tab and tell the program how large this stock sticks out from your intended part in each direction, or at least make sure that the sides that you want to probe off of are accurate. In my case, I'm using a piece of material that's exactly the same outer size as my part in CAD, so I know that I'm safe to probe off of the sides of my material, and not add any stock to the sides. I will add a tiny bit of stock to the top since I know that I want the finished part to have machine surfaces on top and not the raw dull surface. An advanced tip is that if you want to probe off of a surface like the edge of the vise, you can add that in CAD as a sketch and then select that edge in the sketch as your origin point. If you do this, just be careful that you've measured everything correctly. Once your stock is set up correctly, click OK and it's saved under the setup folder which you can double click at any time to edit. Now you're ready to start with actual CAM. In the current setup, you need to add all the operations that you want to happen with one specific tool. If you need to use multiple tools, which we'll do later on, then it needs to be in a separate setup entirely. 
So there are a number of different cam operations available under the 2D and 3D dropdowns. Let's start with a simple facing operation. To face this part, I click on face and now I have this window that pops up. Each operation has a similar window and is fairly straightforward to go through although it looks intimidating at first. The first thing you want to do is click on select tool. This opens up the tool library where there are tons of preloaded tools by Autodesk for various manufacturers and tool holders. We're going to come back to this in a bit, but basically you want to have your own library with your specific tools. I've already set up my own tool library which you can download as well, and so I'm going to select this 6mm 3 flute end mill for aluminum. From here I want to adjust my spindle speed, but instead I'm going to jump to the surface speed and adjust that to the maximum for aluminum, since I know that the DMC2 is a very fast spindle. Looking at a chart of surface speeds for carbide in aluminum, I get about 2000 surface speed per minute, or 610 surface meters per minute in metric. So setting that to 610 automatically updates the spindle speed since all of these parameters are connected by the formulas that dictate them. By setting the tool diameter and surface speed, Fusion 360 tells me to use this RPM at max to stay at the surface speed. Now since my spindle is only 24,000 RPM, I'm going to adjust that down to 24,000 and have to settle with a surface speed that's less than the tool's maximum, which is totally fine. The next thing to adjust is the cutting feed rate. This is how fast the end mill is getting pushed through the part and what this number dictates is the feed per tooth. Alternatively, if I know that for example I want a 0.02mm chip thickness, then I can input that instead and the feed rate will update to reflect. Those are the two main things to adjust when you set up a new toolpath, and as you can see there are a bunch of smaller things that can be adjusted too. I recommend always setting the plunge rate to something very slow like 100mm per minute if you are plunging, which you should never do with a flat end mill unless you really need to. In the next tab, you can adjust the selected area to machine, which in this facing operation is by default preset as the entire stock top. And then in the height, you can adjust how high the machine retracts and approaches the cut. You can usually leave this as default, except if you're doing a tall part and risk the machine running out of z-axis travel and hitting the limit switch. In the passes tab, you can adjust a few more things, most importantly the step over which is how tight the passes are. You can hover over each of these to see what they do. Another important feature is multiple depths which breaks down the cut into multiple smaller layers. You'll use that a lot in other types of toolpaths where there's a lot of depth to cover and the end mill can't handle it all in one go. In the linking tab, there isn't much to bother with, but I do like to select keep tool down with a large value so that the machine doesn't waste time lifting up and down the z-axis unnecessarily. Click OK and the toolpath generates. I can now click on the setup and then simulate and play a simulation of exactly what should happen. Pretty cool. It's important to always skim through the simulation and make sure no weird g-code things occur. In fact, right now, I can see that I don't like how this tool enters the cut by plunging down too hard, so I'm going to edit that now into something more gradual. Okay, so let's say we're done here and ready to go ahead and do this cut on the CNC. To execute this bit of cam, we need to click on the setup that we made earlier which contains all of the cam operations that we want to happen. Right click and click post process. That brings up this window and we can click post at the bottom to generate the desired g-code. Before we click that there are a few things that you need to set up here only once. First we need to change the configurator to Mach 3 mil. If you're using Gerbil or some other controller then you need to select your specific controller configuration here instead. And second we can change the output folder. I like to set this to a folder in my Dropbox so that the file automatically gets synced on the CNC computer and I don't have to physically walk over with a USB. I highly recommend you do something similar too since it saves so much time and effort. There are a few other little settings here you can modify, but I never needed to change anything from default. I do like to uncheck the open NC file because I don't need to see the file every time I post it. For this example, let's leave it on and see what happens. So we click post, the file gets saved, and it opens the file in a text editor as well. So this is what the file looks like. It's just raw text in the language of G-code. Each line is a single command and you can search up what each thing means. In fact, you can write G-code entirely by hand or go into this file and edit it manually if needed. Now I've never needed to do that, but sometimes in unusual situations you might want to, but Fusion 360 is pretty good at doing exactly what you want it to do. So now that you have your file on your CNC computer, you're ready to load that in Mach 3 and start cutting. In the next video, I'm going to take a detailed look at all the toolpaths available in Mach 3, and then after that, we'll move on to the actual CNC and take a look at how to load files and start cutting. For now, there is one important thing I mentioned previously which I want to dive into first. That's the tool library in Fusion 360. 
You want to have all of your tools that you physically own saved into your library so that Fusion 360 knows exactly what you have available to work with. So on the top bar, we can click Tool Library, and then this brings up all of the default sample tools loaded in Fusion 360. What we want is our own personal tools loaded in the local library like I have here. So under Local, we can create a folder, and then in that folder, add a new tool. Clicking the plus opens up the tool type to add, so let's say I want to add this 6mm 3 flute square end mill. I'll click the flat end mill, I'll give it a memorable name, under the cutter tab I'll fill out all of the parameters, under the holder tab I'll add the ER20 collet that the DMC2 has, now under cutting data this is where the magic happens. So since this is a carbide tool made for aluminum, I know right away what the recommended surface speed is from the manufacturer for carbide in aluminum. That's about 2000 surface speed per minute, or 610 meters per minute. You can see when I put that number in, Fusion 360 automatically calculates the required spindle speed because it knows the tool diameter. The numbers in this speed box are all connected to each other with formulas, so by knowing the surface speed, the rest is solved. The speed this end mill wants to run at a maximum is 32,362 RPM, but the DMC2 spindle is only 24,000 RPM. So in this case, we can input our max speed instead, and know that we aren't pushing the end mill to its surface speed limit, which is fine, but we are making use of the maximum machine power available without exceeding the end mill's speed limit, which is great. Next, we can look at the feed rate box, and the only thing you really need to adjust is the feed per tooth. That's how thick of a chip we want to take with this end mill, and I'll set this to a small amount to start with, and see how the machine handles. Setting that, then updates the other numbers in this box, and for ramp, I'll just input a slightly lower number than the normal cutting feed rate. A ramp move is basically the end mill slowly descending diagonally into a deep cut rather than plunging straight down. You always want to ramp and never plunge if possible. Note that the DMC2 has a maximum feed rate of around 8000 mm per minute, and we're nowhere near approaching that, so that's fine. In vertical feed rates, I'm going to put a small number because again, end mills really don't like plunging. They get loaded up with chips and stall easily doing that. I could add a default step down and step over numbers, but I'll leave that off for now. I can also turn on the coolant automatically each time this tool is used, but I personally prefer to keep it off in cam and manually turn it off when I start a job. In the post processor tab, you don't need to worry about this at all, but it's a good idea not to have two tools assign the same tool number. And now that we're done, click accept. And now when we select a new tool path and select a tool, we can find our tool in the library. And all of the preset cutting parameters for our tool are already loaded in and we just need to look over a few things and make sure the toolpath is cutting where we want. Doing this saves all the time of manually entering numbers and guessing and calculating or making mistakes every time we create a new toolpath. And on top of that, you can download my tool library where I've already taken all the common tools I sell and input recommended feeds and speeds that work well on the DMC2. All of these feeds and speeds are derived from my DMC2 feeds and speeds video, so you can go there and get an idea of how I came to these values. First mathematically, and then actually testing and bumping the numbers up more and more until I approach a comfortable amount that isn't pushing the machine limits and isn't breaking the tool, but is getting as much material removed as fast as possible. Okay, so we covered part setups, an introduction to toolpaths, and the tool library. In the next video, we'll look at all the common toolpaths in Fusion 360 and how to use them. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode.